Good afternoon and welcome to the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance training. Today is a short course uh, put on with Trent Cotney. He is the CEO with Cotney Attorneys and Consultants, who are also the attorneys for the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance. My name is John Jensen. I'm a roofing contractor out of the Pacific Northwest, and I also manage the training program for the, for the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance. Uh, Trent is here. We'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, Lisa Jensen is also here. She's the training director and is monitoring. Uh, so if you have any questions or any technical difficulties, you can reach her with the question feature on your, uh, on your computer. The Tile Roofing Industry Alliance, we recently had a name change. We, we are the Manufacturers Association for Clay and Concrete Roof Tile. So you can see all of the logos of the various manufacturers in our association. Uh, really all of the major manufacturers in the United States are a part of the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance. We changed our name from the Tile Roofing Institute, which sounds a little stuffy, but the, it's a very meaningful change because the Alliance alludes to the fact that we're a relatively small part of the industry and we actually rely greatly. I'm a roofing contractor and I'm allowed to manage and, and run the training program. We really rely on people like myself and people like Trent and, and some, many of you that are online with us today uh, so that we can all have the resources to meet our mission, which is to uh, sell and facilitate the proper installation of clay and concrete roof tile. You can see also that we have a search uh, element on the website that shows where a consumer or a fellow professional can find a contractor, a manufacturer, a supplier, or a roof consultant uh, or attorney in their area. Uh, and that search, you can get onto that search by taking one of the manual certification courses. We have a certification course for the regular manual, which covers 49 states, and then Florida, the Florida Building Code, and in partnership with the Florida Roofing Contractors Association, we have the Florida High Wind Manual certification also. And then in addition, we have short courses like we have today that uh, looking at the attendees today, I think several of you could be, uh, you know, would be interesting enough and have enough knowledge to be presenting one of these. We typically have uh, two short courses per month. So we're always open to suggestions for interesting topics. If you have one, please contact me. Uh, we also have one regular manual and one Florida manual certification each month. And of course, next month we'll be going to the Florida uh, Convention and Expo in Kissimmee. Uh, Florida. As you can see, uh, the attendees today come from across the country. Two of our uh, manufacturer reps are here, Sean, in, uh, uh, Sean and Dylan from Eagle and Borel, uh, and you might recognize some of the other companies. Uh, typically, where uh, our largest areas of sales are in the, uh, the Smile part of the country, the, the southern part of the country. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the adapting to the material shortage and rising costs. In addition to being a roofing contractor, I'm trying to build a home this year, uh, and I'm looking forward greatly to Trent's presentation. As we turn it over to Trent, uh, he will present his uh, slides. He is in a different location. If for any reason you lose contact with us, just either refresh your screen or just sign in and sign out quickly. So. If you don't see his screen now, uh, then go ahead and refresh or sign in and sign out. But you should see his first slide adapting to material shortages and rising costs. And just a quick introduction for Trent. Well, I'll, I'll put it in the form of a thank you. You know, every industry has stars in their industry. And for the roofing industry to have Trent Cottony attorneys and consultants with the passion that Trent and all of his people bring, uh, we're very fortunate. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Trent and remind you that you can submit questions uh, through the question feature. Thank you for being here, Trent. Thank you, John, and, yeah. and thank you, Lisa. And I, I appreciate you guys. Uh, that 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 was a uh, a warm introduction. So I'm very thankful. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing everyone from the Alliance at FRSA. We will be there, um, both uh, speaking and we'll have a booth. So looking forward to uh, seeing you guys in person. And um, to get to the topic at hand, uh, this this is a crisis level issue. I don't, I, I'm not one to mince words, and I, I will tell you that 75% um, of my day for the last six weeks has been devoted to this issue. We have had, um, we keep track of everything here in this office from a data perspective. We are pushing 200 separate roofing contractors that have contacted us with issues related to this. Um, so, you know, that, that gives me a pretty solid statistic to understand the gravity of the situation. 
So um, one of the things I have done is work very closely with our 20 or so offices throughout the U.S. and Canada to gain a better understanding of what these issues are on a granular level. And really, there are two issues that I want to kind of touch on today in the 30 minutes I've got. One is, is bidding or submitting proposals uh, or quotes or whatever it might be for, um, you know, contracts yet to come, projects yet to come. And the other is what happens if you actually have an existing contract? How does that work? And I'm going to talk about it from all levels, from the manufacturer level, from the contractor level, and give you as much insight as I can as to what works. Now, I can tell you one of the things that I experienced early on was I would get a lot of calls from contractors that were irate and were blaming distribution or blaming the manufacturers. And um, I've always valued my relationships with every industry partner. Um, you know, others, you know, may may see it differently, but for me, uh, I have always accomplished the best result by flying in formation. Meaning, if we are all aligned and marching in the same direction. Um, then if you get a happy customer, you get a happy contractor, a happy supplier, a happy manufacturer. So what I have tried to do was I tried to create an SOP, a standard operating procedure to deal with this issue as it relates to contracts that you've already got signed. Okay. And this was created over the weeks of me struggling and having to deal with this and finding out what works and what doesn't work. So I've got a four step process. I'm gonna go into it in a little bit more detail. But the first thing I wanna do is I wanna set the stage, right? I wanna identify what the issue is to the customer because the customer may or may not uh, understand exactly what the problems are, okay? Um, and I'll talk about how to do that. I wanna go through whatever contract document I have and I wanna sit down and I wanna identify anything that would give me a colorable argument to assert a claim. So we're going to talk about a few things in particular, force majeure, which is fancy legal language for act of God, uh, delay claims, pricing provisions, things like that. Once I have identified what those key provisions are, then what I want to do is I want to submit a change order or a claim, or I want to come to the, let's say it's a homeowner, I want to come to the homeowner with a written proposal for whatever the increase or the additional time is. And um, I want to advocate in that in that document, right? I want to be able to say, um, set the stage. I want to say, this is what's going on. Uh, pursuant to provision 4.1, I'm entitled to you know additional costs, so on and so forth. Um, and I want to advocate. Okay, one of the worst things that I see a lot of contractors doing, uh, especially on the residential side, is they don't do a good enough job of paper in the file. Right. Um, you, for those of you that have heard me talk in the past, there's one thing that I say pretty much every webinar I do, and that is in construction, it is the party with the best paper that wins the day. So if you are adequately backfilling your position with great documentation, it's going to make your life easier. It's going to make my life easier, your lawyer's life easier. Right. Um, so what I want is I want some advocacy in that change. Order. I don't want you to just push paper. I want there to be some advocacy there. Then after you've done that, then you pick up the phone. Okay, that's a much better tactic than starting off with picking up the phone and saying, hey, that uh, tile you, you know, the, the package that you ordered for this, um, guess what, it's a $25,000 increase, I need you to pay it, okay? That's not gonna get you very far. If you follow this process, you stand a much better chance of being able to negotiate off center, okay? So you want to always come from a position of strength rather than falling on your sword. With that as the backdrop for the conversation, let me get into it a little bit more. Now, the issues, everybody's blaming COVID, right? COVID, COVID, COVID. And yeah, COVID's part of it, but this is not a one isolated event. There are about 20 different causes that have led to the issue that we're currently dealing with. To give you an idea, here's just some of the issues, okay? One of the biggest issues is that uh, a lot of manufacturers, distribution, and contractors um, believe the old adage that inventory kills. You know, so there's a just-in-time inventory, which means you are ordering stuff at the last second so that you are not depleting your cash reserves and you are using it as needed. Well, you know, we see this foam adhesive is a great example. You know, there are some component materials there that are sourced elsewhere. 
in order to make that end product that could not be obtained. What that happens, what causes that is a ripple effect, which you know in turn hurts the manufacturer, it hurts distribution, it hurts the contractor. Okay, when you couple that with um, you know worldwide shortages in shipping, we don't have enough ships to haul the stuff. We are uh, facing an all-time high for a trucker shortage. Uh, we've had border closures. We've had tariffs. We've had um, you know entire manufacturing plants shut down for weeks because of COVID-19. You know, I'm speaking to you from Florida. Uh, we've been wide open pretty much forever, uh, but there's a lot of states that aren't like that, right? So um, you may have been impacted by local or state requirements that wouldn't let you produce what you needed to produce, okay? So all of these issues have culminated in just a shortage of everything, everything from, you know, sealants to roofing membranes to fastener plates to, um, you know, boots to you name it. I mean, um, I, I have the amount of horse trading that I, I have to do is incredible. I mean, honestly, we've got a training center here. I'm thinking about selling some of these, you know, plowing some of this other stuff on the black market. You know, it's, it's become so valuable. So um, this gives you an idea of kind of what the issues are. Now, this is one of the key things that I want to hit home to you guys. OK, and if you don't take anything away from this, this has worked for me. I have, you know, I am blessed that I've got some great relationships with manufacturers and distributors, and, and I talk to them on a daily basis. You know, I, they're, I, like I said, I, I may have a different viewpoint than a lot of people do, but I believe we all fly in formation. We're all part of the same industry. So um, one of the things that I have been most successful with is reaching directly out to manufacturers or to suppliers and saying, I need your help. Okay, what I need you to do is I need you to put a letter together for me that says that with regard to this material, this, you know, where we are right now, completely unforeseeable. Okay, this was unforeseen. Better yet, this is an act of God. It's force majeure. It's impossible for us to perform because we can't obtain the resin that we need in order to make this material. Okay, better yet, what I want you to do is I want you to, can you track this language in the contract for me? Because what I am doing, now pay attention to this, okay? What I am doing is I'm taking that letter and then I'm putting it upstream, right? So I'm attaching it to the change order, I'm attaching it to the claim, I'm submitting it to the homeowner, and I'm saying, don't take my word for it. You know, you probably think I'm a crook because I'm a contractor, but that's not the case. Here is national manufacturer that's saying the same exact thing, okay? And that helps change the dynamic. It changes the rhetoric. Uh, it, it works, okay? Does it work in every occasion? No. But I have, you know, I had a uh, international manufacturer contact me the other day and said, Trent, we listened to one of your, your, your webinars or whatever. Can you do us a draft letter that we can help our contractors with? I said, buddy, not only I do that, I will do it no charge because what I want is um, I don't want the industry to be experiencing these kind of problems. It's, it, this is a crisis level issue. And it's not just the industry that's that's noted this. I put a, um, a website link here. The Biden administration has come out and said, we're going to do a task force on this. What does that mean? That means they don't know how to solve the problem. That means a bunch of people will sit in a room and they probably won't solve the problem, but it sounds good. OK, so uh, this is the kind of stuff that you use to set the stage. OK, number one, set the stage. Number two, you want to look for the key contract provisions. OK, we all. If you didn't hear about force majeure during COVID-19, I'm going to talk to you about it now, okay? Um, we're going to talk about pricing provisions. We're going to talk about change orders and claims and delays. And I said it before, I'll say it again. Happy customer, happy contractor. That's all you got to worry about. It's not about pointing fingers. It's keeping the customer happy, okay? It's the customer experience. That's all that matters. Force majeure, what is it? Well, uh, I put a classic force majeure provision in here. Okay, pre-COVID-19, and basically what it says is that if there's an event like a hurricane, a war, a strike, terrorism, something that is beyond your control that makes it impossible for you to perform, then that may excuse your performance or are entitled to you some, to some relief. Now, I can tell you that post-COVID-19, we developed a more robust provision that includes everything from federal and state emergencies um, that also includes material or equipment unavailability. Okay, and if you, I've, I've read dozens upon dozens of these provisions since this crisis has happened, occasionally you will find uh, a nugget like material or equipment unavailability in that force majeure provision. If you find that, 
that is a blessing right there because you can use that and that can form a great basis for you to get some relief. Price quotes. Okay, I get these complaints all the time. Well, you know, manufacturer distribution told me this was the price, you know, and now it's not the price. And I ask them, well, is it a quote? They say, yeah, it's a quote. Okay, and I said, well, a quote's a quote. An estimate is an estimate. Um, read your credit app, you know. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm trying not to be flippant, but the, the thing that I want to hit home is you need to buy materials now, okay? Um, it's better to, to, if you know that you are going to need materials, secure them. Work with your distribution to secure whatever you need on hand to cover the orders that you've got, okay? Um, I've had to negotiate storage. If you can't store the materials uh, at your warehouse or in your yard, uh, or you can't rooftop them, or you can't put them on the job site, work with the owner to come off, you know, to split the difference on off-site storage. Um, it has been, uh, now clearly this doesn't work for everything. If this is a material that's got a limited shelf life, you don't want to be ordering a bunch in advance. But if you know you're going to need something, you know, uh, adhesive or uh, fasteners or tile or whatever it might be, get it in, right? Get it in so that you know that you've got some on hand. Now, I have had some reports of some uh, hoarding going on, some speculation by certain contractors that are, you know, buying a bunch of stuff and just storing it, um, thinking that they, they can use it. And maybe they can, maybe they can't. My concern with that is that if you don't know for certain that you'll be able to use it, you're burning through your cash. Okay? I know of one contractor that's spent $600,000 on materials just to have them, okay? I don't know if I'd be doing that. 600,000 bucks is a lot of money. So um, the key here is, is you wanna be thinking proactively about it. Some other things that you wanna think about is that if you are faced with uh, a dramatic increase in the price itself, um, how do you deal with that with your customer? Well, again, you wanna look back at your contract, okay? I'm gonna give you a price acceleration provision in here. Uh, it is money, okay? If you don't already have that in your contract, put it in your contract, okay? If you don't have it in your contract and uh, you have a signed one and you're trying to negotiate with your customer, part of the thing I like to do during negotiations is I, is I like to say, look, I don't know what the future holds for this material. Why don't we agree to do this? Why don't we say, you know, I'll cover up to 15%, but anything over that, you got to help me out, okay? Um, it, it's a good talking point. So, I'm, you know, and the other thing is, is to the extent that you can avoid fixed prices on materials, you need to do it. And I know that's difficult, but you've got to give yourself some wiggle room because a lot of contractors are getting caught by these increased prices. This is a standard price acceleration provision, okay? And we'll, we'll send a PowerPoint after this, so you got it. Um, if this is going in your contract, uh, and nobody signed it yet, 5% works for me generally, okay? Uh, that last sentence is optional. It says you can terminate the contract if it goes over 10%. It's hard to get that executed, right? Most of your customers don't want to sign that, so feel free to delete it. Um, if you are negotiating on an existing contract, you can use this as a basis to negotiate whatever that percentage is, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. I'm seeing some virtual head nods, so I will move on. Managing lead times. Okay, uh, systemic problems. I'm going to give you uh, some real world stories here. Uh, I had a contractor call me in a panic earlier this week. Um, they have a very large public project um, and they cannot get the material in. They were told by this manufacturer that they can't get uh, the stuff that they need in in order to complete this project project has a liquidated damages provision in it. We'll talk about that. Um, so they say, well, what can I do? So I pick up the phone to, you know, he'd been talking to a tech rep and a sales rep. I picked up the phone to management. I said, hey, you gotta, you, you, what can you do for me? Can you help me? Can you please help me, help me? And they said, well, here's what we can do. We can shift some stuff around. We can get you a partial order in so your guy can start doing some work. And I said, that's fine, but I need to know when the rest of the stuff can come. And he said, Trent, you will be opening Christmas presents by the time I can get you this stuff. And I said, thank you. Thank you. I needed honesty. I have to understand that. Don't sugarcoat stuff. Tell me what the, re the reality is so that I can work with my customer. on it." So I turned to the contractor and what we did, what we're now doing is we've got attorneys, but we also have consultants. 
Uh, we are currently looking at um, the entire uh, critical path of this project to figure out, can we resequence work? Is it possible to go to the customer and say, hey, can you move these other contractors around? And my guy can come in at the end and finish up the rest of this so that there isn't any delay. You know, what can we do to do other work or shift stuff around to minimize the impact, okay? And it requires creative thinking, okay? And um, ultimately, if we get to the end of this and I can't come up with enough time, then I'm gonna submit a time request. So what, I'm just, I'm doing anything and everything I can possibly think of to save the customer, right? So the other thing that you wanna be thinking about is substitution of materials. Now, I want to give a word of caution here. And for those manufacturer reps, manufacturers on the line, you know what I'm going about what I'm about to say. Okay. If you are substituting materials, you need to be careful of a couple things. One is, is that you want to make sure that the manufacturer will still honor your warranty. Uh, manufacturers like apples to apples. They get very upset when it's apples to oranges. Okay. Um, you want to make sure you get manufacturer sign off. For whatever material substituting so if you're substituting fasteners adhesive whatever it is you know you want to make sure you you that they will still honor whatever warranty you have promised to the end user the second thing that you want to do is you want to make sure upstream let's say you got an architect or an engineer uh or you know if you're in florida for example you want to make sure that you that your uh, material that you have substituted We'll continue to meet code, we'll continue to meet wind uplift requirements. Uh, we'll check all the boxes, cross the T's and dot the I's with regard to all design specifications. Uh, because if you want a customer to screw you over, that is an easy way for them to do it. Okay, so um, watch out on shortcuts. Uh, make sure that you are, are crossing your T's, dotting your I's, both upstream and downstream. Okay. Um, Let's talk about, uh, this is a material availability provision that I wanted to give you. Okay, now I made this simplistic on purpose. You know, I've got other versions of this that are a lot more robust that are a page long, but part of this, you know, let me take a step back, okay? You know, we review dozens upon dozens of contracts a week. Um, one of the things I always tell customers is, look, your contract is the trench that you fall back into when customer service doesn't work. OK, you guys wouldn't be on this call with me right now if you didn't have good customer service. Right. You wouldn't be in this business. So you've got to be able to manage those customer expectations. But what a lot of people don't realize is that a contract not only helps you defend against claims and prosecute claims, it helps you educate your customer. This is a great example of that. OK, this is a great educational provision. OK. And if you already have a signed existing contract, if you're in the process of coming to the table to negotiate, it'd be great to include something like this moving forward, okay, if you're doing an amendment or a revision. The idea is just you want to be able to explain, look, this is where we're at. We're going to do our best to make sure there aren't delays, but if there, if there are because of this, you got to work with us, okay? You can't ding us. That's what it says simplistically. Now, I want to talk a little bit about delays, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you guys, but I got 30 minutes, so I'm going to get as much as I can in. Delay clauses, okay? Um, the biggest issue that I'm seeing contractors face now as a result of these lead times is, is delay claims. They're getting hit with liquidated damages. They're getting hit with delay claims upstream. They've got upset customers. Um, what do you need to know about that, okay? What I always like to do is I, if you have a contract that has a delay clause in it, you want to really make sure that you're taking a look at it, okay? And every contract is different, but oftentimes you may have the capability of submitting a delay claim, okay? Um, watch out for what is known as a no damages for delay clause. What that is, it's a provision that says you are entitled to additional time for delays, but you're not going to get money, okay? Now, I would not have a job if I couldn't figure out how to get around that provision. So that's not the end all be all. For example, if your customer actively interferes with your project, you can get around that provision generally. Um, but really what the issue is, is people need more time. That is the biggest issue. So what I want you to focus on is look at every aspect of this project and make sure 
that you are submitting requests for time extensions, okay? Absolutely imperative. I'm probably gonna say it one or two more times here, but you absolutely have to do that. If you are, um, we're, we're in rainy season. I'm, in, I'm speaking to you from Tampa. I think it's rained every day this week. Um, you know, I, I'm stuck in this office 12, 13 hours a day, so I don't go outside much, but from what I can tell, it's been raining. So um, one of the things that you need to understand is that if you have a rain delay, don't get lazy on your paperwork. You need to make sure that you are submitting that one day for a request for time extension. Do it immediately. If you can't work for half a day because the HVAC contractors mucking stuff up, okay, you want to submit that. Submit everything. Don't get lazy because you may need that time. You may need that time, okay? Now, let me give you trick of the trade. This is this is 301 level stuff I'm giving you. Um, how do I defeat delay claims because of this material uh, lead time problem? One of the things that I've been very successful doing is I look back at the history of the project, just had this last week, uh, owner, owner stopped the project during January and February, two month delay, okay? But for that delay, the contractor would have been completed several months ago before this was a bigger problem, right? So my argument is yes, I can't get the materials now, but the only reason I am ordering these materials now is because I did not have the notice to proceed when I should have received it because you are an idiot owner, okay? That is the argument. You guys follow me? That prior impact caused this delay, not the current delay, okay? That is a creative argument that gets you in the game. Oftentimes, that's all I'm trying to do. My job as a lawyer is to turn chicken doo-doo into chicken salad, and that is a great way to do it, okay? And again, substitution of materials. If you have the capability to substitute materials to potentially avoid delays, you want to look into that. You, you need to get creative. It is not a money issue. It is a days issue, okay? Yes, there's increased job office overhead. There's a soft cost, I get it, but really this is about keeping the customer at bay. So these are all great examples of things that you can do internally to deal with that. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about dealing with liquidated damages. For those of you that don't know, what liquidated damages are is oftentimes in the owner contract, the prime contract, there will be a provision that says the completion date is, you know, whatever, June 16th. And for every day over that, you are entitled to $250 or $1,000 or whatever it might be, okay? So here is something that a lot of contractors and a lot of other people in the industry don't realize, that when you are fighting an LD claim, it is not about the money. It's about the days. Don't focus on the money. Don't negotiate the money. Work on the days. So if you are 53 days over your scheduled completion date, all you need to do is find 53 days, okay? That's all you got to do. So what I do is I go to work and I look for excusable delay. Did you get, you know, what were there rain? Was there rain? Did you get a time extension? You know, concurrent delay. Was the owner or the prime contractor or someone else also delaying you at the same time you were being delayed, okay? Uh, did that HVAC contractor cause you delay? Okay, was there a prior impact that caused this delay? And don't forget about all those contract arguments, okay? If it was impossible for you to perform, if this was a force majeure, as stated by that nice letter that the manufacturer gave you, then you shouldn't, that should be excusable, right? You shouldn't have to suffer days as a result of that, okay? Um, that is uh, how you go about doing it. All you need are days, that's it. It is not about the dollars, it's about the days. Again, rework your schedule to accommodate lead times, okay? You've got, this is something where I, I firmly believe that every sector of the industry needs to be open and apparent. You know, for the longest time, you know, uh, contractor, distributor, manufacturer, we all play a shell game, right? And it's all, let's, let's, Tell them some things, hide the ball in the other. This is something we're all in this together. Let's hold hands and figure out a way to get through it because it's going to be a lot worse if we start eating our own, right? I don't want I don't want that to happen. So rework the schedule to figure out how you can accommodate the lead times to work with your customer. Absolutely imperative because by doing that, 
you can maximize efficiency without doing what's known as acceleration, okay? Let me explain generally what acceleration is, okay? And this can happen on both residential projects and commercial, okay? You could be, um, you know, on a residential project and you have promised, let's say you're, you're doing a tile roof for a homeowner and you have promised this homeowner that you are going to get this project done in four weeks, okay? And um, you have a series of delays related to not being able to get the materials. And the first time that you are able to actually start doing work other than the tear off is week three. Okay, so that, that means you have compressed your schedule into a one week period rather than a four week period. Okay, if this were not your own doing, if someone else required you to do this, then you potentially have what's known as an acceleration claim because you're having to truncate your schedule because of someone else's screw up. You're having to work weekends, you're having to mobilize additional workforce, whatever it might be. Okay. So you want to avoid um, incurring acceleration costs to the extent that you can, rework your schedule, do what you can, get creative, okay? Uh, you have to be proactive. That's one of the key things that I wanna hit home. So one of the things that I, I want to tell you guys, and I'm gonna turn it over to you for questions because I know I've hit a lot here, is you need to understand this is here to stay. This is not going anywhere. You will see this through the end of the year, you will probably see this through first quarter or second quarter, okay? Um, one of the things that uh, you should know is that as we enter storm season, we're gonna get some major hurricanes, that's going to put additional pressure on supply. So things like decking, you know, sealants, everything else that you normally need in order to complete projects, um, even if you are not in the geographic area where the hurricane hits, it creates disruption throughout the system. So it's only going to get worse. And I really think that the worst of it is yet to come, okay? Order now and impress upon the customer the importance of doing so, right? So if I didn't mention it before, this is a great time to, co to go to your homeowner and say, look, it, here are some documentation to, to talk to you about this issue, about the shortages and the price increases. If you sign the contract today, I can order this material today and lock this in for you, okay? But if you want time to think about it, then I may, you know, it depends on what the price is at the time that you do it. So sign today, you know. Um, everybody hates the lawyers, everybody hates legal, but this is a great way where you can potentially use it to your advantage to help sell. And it doesn't matter where you are in the food chain, you can use that same kind of pressure technique to potentially close deals. Again, store materials on site in the yard, get a warehouse, whatever it is. It's better to have stuff in hand so you can keep working rather than waiting around and playing on the internet. Okay, so do what you got to do in order to get materials. Um, you know, but was talking to a bunch of contractors up in Chicago. Um, they've created a great little network where they're sharing stuff. They're actually, you know, calling each other up and saying, hey, can you spot me this? And they're starting to barter. They'll say, yeah, I'll give you X number of pieces of plywood if you can give me, you know, this, this amount of membrane for this roof. And it's working. You know, it's just old school barter. So, um, discuss these issues frequently with your reps, um, with distribution, with the industry. This is not a time for you to uh, put your head in the sand. Okay, it's very important that you determine current status. You know, I have received price increase notifications of 100% same day. Okay, <laughs> that makes everyone's life miserable. So it's important that you get out ahead of this stuff, that you do your best to stay informed, okay? Uh, to the extent that you can, avoid bids and proposals that lock in prices and scheduling, okay? And I know I know you're saying, Trent, that's impossible. You know, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, yeah, it is in general, but what you can do is you can look for caveats. You can look for carve-outs, okay? If, for example, if you know you are gonna do a residential job and you know there are certain things like decking or you know soffit or other stuff that you're gonna be doing in addition to tile, you know, you can do that on a time and materials basis where you say, you know, here's the labor rate um, and materials are cost plus X, okay? And what that does is it takes that added thing that normally you would, you would, you know, charge the customer and it allows you to fluctuate with the existing uh, market pressures. So look for ways to do that. Um, that. That is going to assist you. 
And what I want to do now is, is turn it over to you guys and um, answer any questions that you've got. I, I literally have, you know, slept, eaten, and breathed this for six weeks. So uh, I, I, am, I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, great, Trent. And I'm going to, uh, as usual, we'll, we'll get questions once Lisa opens up the mic, but I'll ask you one just to start off with because I see the contractors that are on here today and it's a relatively savvy group. Uh, typically, you know, I would look at myself and say, I'm just a small contractor. I always was. I'm not out doing a lot of new construction or re-roof now, but that's what I did. So I would be the guy that would have come to you today and said, I've been bidding jobs all spring, telling them I'll do them in July and August. And I have no escalation clause. I have no nothing in my contract that says anything about price increases because it's not something I've experienced and the modest increases that sometimes happen, I eat. Um, and that's not going to happen this year. It's going to be a different situation. So what are you, what are you going to say to somebody like me that comes with absolutely no protection in my contract at all? Yeah, and, and that's yeah, not atypical, that's not John. Atypical. And that's I, I see that all the time, you know, and that's, that's that, look, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. That's part of the process. And, you know, what I, what I like to do is I, I like to have, um, I like to use that process that I talked about. You know, I like to, uh, go to your homeowner. Let me get it up there. Go to your homeowner and set the stage. You know, send the documentation. Send the documentation not only from, you know, associations and and you know the alliance and um, you know the news, but also distribution and manufacturers and say, look, here's this issue. This is completely unforeseen. This is what it is. I need to come with you, and I've got to I got to work with you to renegotiate this. Okay, and they may hem and haul, but I've had conversations with, you know, attorneys on the other side and I said, look, here's your choice. You know, you work with us or good luck getting this project done by the end of the year because it's going to take you forever to find somebody. And then once you find them, they're going to charge you as much or more for the materials and probably more for the labor. And then you're probably never going to get it anyway. So at least you're in queue now. OK, uh, if you have to start from scratch, you're going to be pushed back that much more. So let's figure out how we can do this. And John, one of the things I've been real successful with is going to the going to a homeowner and saying, look, I need some more money for this, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn that five-year warranty into six for you. And I'm going to give you a maintenance plan. Every quarter I'm going to come out. I'm just going to check, make sure there's no cracked tiles. Um, you know, I'm going to look for stuff that might be covered under the warranty. And I'm going to I'm going to do that out of protection for you. Or, you know, I'll throw in this widget for free, whatever it might be. Okay. You, you got a horse trade a little bit. Um, sometimes you'll have customers that understand that be like, yeah, I don't want to lose my spot. Let's, let's figure out what we got to do. I get it. You know? Um, but most of the time you've got to go to them and you got to say, you've either got to absorb some of it or you've got to offer them something in addition to what you've already offered. Um, and that's the best way to do it. This is, um, always recommend that you come from a position of strength, but if you can't hit item number two, which is identify the key contract provisions. Then you got to start with one. You got to set the stage. But key, here's something else, John, that I want to I want our listeners to understand. You don't necessarily need a contract provision. Okay, I'll say that again. You don't need a contract provision. Okay, under common law, almost in every single state uh, in the United States has something that says that if there's an act of God and it's impossible to to perform, impossibility. Okay, and the other thing is frustration of purpose. If the purpose of this contract has been frustrated by an external force, then that is an excuse to your performance. So you don't necessarily need a contract provision to make that argument. Now, contract provisions are a lot better, but you can still go to the customer and say, look, it is impossible for me to perform this contract. I can't perform it based on what's going on. Here is all the information. Don't take my word for it. But let's sit down and rework this and figure out how I can still keep you in queue. Because the last thing I want to do is see you go somewhere else and then not have this project done until the end of the year. You know, I can at least, you know, what it's looking like now is I can at least get this to you by the end of August. But, I, you know, who knows where it's going to go from there. So let's work together to see what we can do to get this done. Okay. And that's been that's been my most successful tactic to date, John. No, that, that makes common sense. I think. I asked that question for people like myself, but also I know a lot of the contractors that are involved in residential construction are experiencing cost increases that they wouldn't normally have the time frame, uh, you know, the, the time out to the job that sometimes large new construction projects have. 
So the larger contractors and contractors more familiar with that um, have those provisions in their contract. I know there's a lot of a lot of guys like me that feel that way. So I have one other question. We don't have anybody submitting anything, but I have one other question for you that may be outside of your wheelhouse, but I'll ask it because as I said, we are trying to build this year and we we're at this point we're thinking we're just going to go with our foundation so at least we get that done before winter and can come out of the spring and the starting blocks you know fast what would you do right now if you were building would you go forward or would you wait and what's your expectation that that's a great question and i have conversations on our consulting side all the time you know, john kenny who runs our consulting division he and i work hand in hand and we often what, I, what I've seen, John, is is that often if you have a legal issue, you really have a business issue. It's really an operations issue. So um, what I would recommend is, um, you know, securing projects I think are important. I think moving forward and continuing to do work is important. But I think that that you have to better manage your customer. You have to you have to explain to them that long lead times on getting some of these things may push some of this off. Now. You know, you may be able to work with them and, you know, dry them in or do whatever needs to be done until such time as you can get whatever materials you need to get. But uh, I wouldn't close up shop. You know, I, I wouldn't wait until this this is over because we don't know when it's going to be over. You know, one of the things I'm looking at and I'm watching very closely is this Delta variant that's out there. You know, we're all high fiving each other, vaccinated, everything's great. You know, FRSA is wide open. It's going to be great. You know, all this kind of stuff. But in the back of my mind, I'm I'm watching this, and I keep hearing the stories, and I, I'm I'm concerned. I'm concerned that you know, winter time, um, where we might, you know, it might get bad. So, I would I would continue moving forward, selling jobs, trying to get work. But I think what I would recommend is you got you got to take a close look at your contract, and you got to put some protections in there, and you got to work with your customer and let them understand that uh, there's going to be some issues here where it's going to take a while for us to get through this. And uh, one of the things that I've always said is that when you have, um, you know, a supply and demand disparity like what we have now, you're going to see a, a massive increase in technology. You know, I, I really think that there's going to be a lot of technological advancement uh, that may replace some labor aspects. So um it's going to be interesting to see what the next couple of years are like but john i would i would move forward i would just put in some some great internal operating procedures and i would also work on your contracts and manage your customer expectations because it's going to be here for a while this this uncertainty um i don't see it like i said i don't see it fading definitely through first quarter um i would anticipate maybe even through second quarter you know i hope that i'm just a pessimistic lawyer and i, I hope everything works out great but Every conversation I've had doesn't say it doesn't suggest that. So well, I appreciate that. We don't have any other questions. I will throw in one thing. Uh, I just read an article by Chris Thornberg, who used to speak to our association back in the, the 2000s and, and into the early teens. And, and he kind of agreed with you. He is an analyst, a financial analyst, and he uh, he said that he thought there was enough fuel in in saved money and resources that people are cash rich. And he described the difference between what happened in 2006, seven and eight and what's happening now as being almost the opposite that, you know, people have the resources. So he thought there was enough fuel for this to continue. And he actually said up to two years, um, but uh, you know, that's that's an interesting and scary time frame. Yeah, and, and yeah. here's something else that, you know, not not to be all doom and gloom, but one of the things that I'm watching right now is what's known as the turnover tsunami. And what I'm seeing is, is a lot of roofing contractors and, and people in construction in general, not necessarily their crew because they're hard enough to find anyway, but their home office, we're seeing record high attrition rates. Um, people that, you know, were working from home or were used to a more lackadaisical schedule, um, they don't like their jobs as much anymore and they're looking for other jobs. So, you know, one of the things that I'm also encouraging contractors to do is, is look internally at your your HR policies, you know, what can you do to uh, achieve, you know, cohesion again and make sure that you're focused on that. It's a very interesting time, John, because you're right. We have tons, we've got money, we got demand. Uh, we just don't have, we've never had labor and now we don't have materials either. So it's, it's very interesting. It's a crazy time, but 
Um, the one thing that I know in general is that, uh, you know, when it comes to construction, we we are uh, we pride ourselves on on ingenuity and and the ability to survive and adapt. So that's what I'm looking forward to is not what's bad now, but how do we improvise, adapt, and overcome? Well, great, thank you. Yes, and there's other there's other things that could be worse. You know, we can have a a, a no work. There can be a shortage of work. And right now, I guess in in some ways you could say we're blessed with an overwhelming amount. We just have some challenges that go with it, but. Trent, thank you very much for being here today. This will be uh, this recording will be up probably within a couple of hours on our YouTube channel, and uh, and we look forward to seeing more more people able to access it there. So appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. Too. Take care, everybody.